This is the audiobook of Momo by Michael Ende, narrated by Thomas Werb. Part 1 Momo and her friends 1. The Amphitheater Long, long ago, when people spoke languages quite different from our own, Many fine, big cities already existed in the sunny lands of the world. There were towering places inhabited by kings and emperors. There were broad streets, narrow alleyways and winding lanes. There were sumptuous temples filled with idols of gold and marble. There were busy markets selling wares from all over the world and there were handsome spacious squares where people gathered to discuss the latest news and make speeches or listen to them. Last but not least, there were theaters, or more properly, amphitheaters. An amphitheater resembled a modern circus, except that it was built entirely of stone. Seats for spectators were arranged in tiers, one above the other, like steps lining the crater of a man-made volcano. Many such buildings were circular, others semicircular, others oval. Some amphitheaters were as big as football stadiums, others could hold no more than a few hundred people. Some were resplendent with columns and statues, others plain and unadorned. Having no roofs, amphitheaters were open to the sky. This was why in the more luxurious ones, spectators were shielded from the heat of the sun or from sudden downpours by gold-embroidered awnings suspended above their seats. In simple amphitheaters, mats woven of rushes or straw served the same purpose. In short, People made their amphitheaters as simple or luxurious as they could afford, just as long as they had one, for our ancestors were enthusiastic playgoers. Whenever they saw exciting or amusing incidents acted out on stage, they felt as if these make-believe happenings were more real in some mysterious way than their own humdrum lives and they loved to feast their eyes and ears on this kind of reality. Thousands of years have passed since then. The great cities of long ago lie in ruins, together with their temples and palaces. Wind and rain, heat and cold have worn away and eaten into the stonework. Ruins are all that remain of the amphitheaters too. Crickets now inhabit their crumbling walls, singing a monotonous song that sounds like the earth breathing in its sleep. A few of these ancient cities have survived to the present day, however. Life there has changed, of course. People ride around in cars and buses, have telephones and electric lights, but here and there, among the modern buildings, one can still find a column or two, an archway or a stretch of wall or even an amphitheater dating from olden times. It was in a city of this kind that the story of Momo took place. On the southern outskirts of the city, where the fields began and the houses became shabbier and more tumble-down, the ruins of a small amphitheatre lay hidden in a clump of pine trees. It had never been a grand place, even in the old days, just a place of entertainment for poor folk. When Momo arrived on the scene, the ruined amphitheater had been almost forgotten. Its existence was known to a few professors of archaeology, but they took no further interest in it because there was nothing more to be unearthed there. It wasn't an attraction to be compared with others in the city, 
either saw the few stray tourists or sightseers who visited it from time to time merely clambered around on the grass-grown tiers of seats, made a lot of noise, took a couple of snapshots, and went away again. Then silence returned to the stone arena, and the crickets started on the next verse of their interminable, unchanging song. The strange round buildings was really known only to the folk who lived in the immediate neighborhood. They grazed their goats there, their children played ball on what had once been the central stage, and sweethearts would sometimes meet there in the evenings. One day, however, word went around that someone had moved into the ruins. It was a child, a girl, most likely, though it was hard to say because she wore such funny clothes. The newcomer's name was Momo. Aside from being rather odd, Momo's personal appearance might well have shocked anyone who set store by looking clean and tidy. She was so small and thin that, with the best will in the world, no one could have told her age. Her unruly mop of jet black hair looked as if it had never seen a comb or a pair of scissors. She had very big, beautiful eyes, as black as her hair, and feet of almost the same color, for she nearly always went around barefoot. Although she sometimes wore shoes in the winter time, the only shoes she had weren't a pair, and besides they were far too big for her. This was because Momo owned nothing apart from what she had found lying around or had been given. Her ankle-length dress was a mass of patches of different colors, and over it she wore a man's jacket, also far too big for her, with the sleeves turned up at the wrist. Momo had decided against cutting them off because she wisely reflected that she was still growing, and goodness only knew if she would ever find another jacket as useful as this one with all its many pockets. Beneath the grassy stage of the ruined amphitheater, half choked with the rubble, were some underground chambers which could be reached by way of a hole in the outer wall, and this was where Momo had set up house. One afternoon, a group of men and women from the neighborhood turned up and tried to question her. Momo eyed them apprehensively, fearing that they had come to chase her away, but she soon saw that they meant well. Being poor like herself, they knew how hard life could be. So, said one of the men, you like it here, do you? Momo nodded. And do you want to stay here? Yes, very much. Won't you be missed, though? No. I mean, shouldn't you go home? This is my home, Momo said promptly. But where do you come from? Momo gestured vaguely at some undefined spot in the far distance. Who are your parents, then? the man persisted. Momo looked blankly from him to the others and gave a little shrug. The man and woman exchanged glances and sighed. There's no need to be scared, the man went on. We haven't come to evict you. We'd like to help you, that's all. Momo nodded and said nothing, not entirely reassured. You're called Momo, aren't you? Yes. That's a pretty name, but I've never heard of it before. Who gave it to you? I did, said Momo. You choose your own name? Yes. When were you born? Momo pondered this. As far as I can remember, I've always been around. But don't you have any aunts or uncles or grandparents? Don't you have any relations at all who'd give you a home? Momo just looked at the man in silence for a while. Then she murmured, This is my home here. 
That's all very well, said the man, but you're only a kid. How old are you really? Momo hesitated. A hundred, she said. They all laughed because they thought she was joking. No, no, seriously, how old are you? A hundred and two, Momo replied, still more hesitantly. It was some time before the others realized that she'd picked up a few numbers but had no precise idea of their meaning, because no one had ever thought her to count. Listen, said the man after conferring with the others. Would you mind if we told the police you were here? Then you'd be put in a children's home where they feed you and give you a proper bed and teach you reading and writing and lots of other things. How does that appeal to you? Momo gazed at him in horror. No, she said in a low voice. I've already been in one of those places. There were other children there too and bars over the windows. We were beaten every day for no good reason. It was awful. One night I climbed the wall and ran away. I wouldn't want to go back there. I can understand that, said an old man nodding, and the others could understand and nodded too. Very well, said one of the women, but you're still so little. Someone has to take care of you. Momo looked relieved. I can take care of myself. Can you really, said the woman. Momo didn't answer at once. Then she said softly, I don't need much. Again the others exchanged glances and sighed. Know something, Momo, said the man who had spoken first. We were wondering if you like to move in with one of us. It's true we don't have much room ourselves, and most of us already have a horde of children to feed. But we reckoned one more won't make any difference. What do you say? Thank you, Momo said, smiling for the first time. Thank you very much. But couldn't you just let me go on living here? After much deliberation, the others finally agreed. It occurred to them that she would be just as well off here as with one of them, so they decided to look after Momo together. It would be easier in any case for all of them to do so than for one of them alone. They made an immediate start by spring cleaning Momo's dungeon and refurbishing it as best as they could. One of them, a bricklayer by trade, built her a miniature cooking stove and produced a rusty stovepipe to go with it. The old man, who was a carpenter, nailed together a little table and two chairs out of some packing cases. As for the woman folk, they brought along an iron bedstead adorned with curlicues, a mattress with only a few rents in it, and a couple of blankets. The stone cell beneath the stage of the ruined amphitheater became a snug little room. The bricklayer, who fancied himself as an artist, added the finishing touch by painting a pretty flower picture on the wall. He even painted a pretended frame around it and the pretend nail as well. Last of all, the people's children came along with whatever food they could spare. One brought a morsel of cheese, another a hunk of bread, another some fruit, and so on. And because so many children came, the occasion turned into a regular housewarming party. Momo's installation in the old amphitheater was celebrated as successfully as only the poor of this world know how. And that was the beginning of her friendship with the people of the neighborhood.